really matters? That might be the most important question you can ask. So let's talk about it. Welcome to What Really Matters podcast, Everyday Spirituality with Karen Wyatt. Thanks for joining me here again today. In the previous three episodes, I've been taking you on a journey with me through Italy where I was dealing with profound grief and also guilt on um, my very first trip to Europe with my husband, uh, I called it a ruined trip because initially it felt ruined. And I've been talking about this experience of of receiving an intuitive hit that I needed to do a novena or I needed to say a prayer every day for nine days about the grief that the family of my patient was experiencing back home and the grief that was absolutely swallowing me up on this trip, grief over my patient's death, but also grief over my father's death that had risen up once again to the surface um, to, to really burden me and take me down. And so this is the next episode in that series that I want to share with you. And this would be the third novena which took place in Florence, Italy. So we we traveled from Rome to Florence by train and found Florence to be just a profoundly beautiful city, absolutely amazing with so much cultural and historical significance. And while we were there visiting the Uffizi Gallery and the Academia where um, the David statue by Michelangelo is is featured um we learned so much about the renaissance and um that history was really profound to me i think i saw it through new eyes partly because of my own grief and what i was experiencing and um first of all was the realization that the renaissance followed soon after devastation by the Black Death, which took place during the 14th century. And in the city of Florence, the Black Death, the plague, wiped out um, over 50% of the population. And you think about how devastating that would be if half of all the people that you knew had died uh, within one year's time of the plague. And what a profound impact the Black Death had on everything in society. One of the things I I learned about is simply the reduction in population had a big impact because there were labor shortages in every area. But ultimately, that meant that workers were valued more and actually began to be paid more. So jobs became more available, people could get better jobs for better pay. And the survivors of the Black Death had this opportunity to make their lives a little bit better. There was also a redistribution of wealth because survivors, many survivors inherited wealth from their loved ones. And this led to one of the positive features of the Renaissance was the patronage movement when families like the Medici family became patrons of the arts. Because of this inherited and redistributed wealth, there was more money available to support artists, and that began to happen. And That was one of the key factors in the Renaissance taking place in Florence. There was also a shift in worldview. And a few weeks ago, I talked about went on my trip to Portugal, learning how the earthquake, tsunami, and fires that took place in Portugal led to a, a shift in worldview there, which actually followed the Renaissance. It was Portugal was a little bit late to come to these these kinds of changes. They had already happened in Europe earlier, but similarly, after the Black Death. 
many people began to reconsider some of the traditional values and beliefs that they had just accepted without really thinking about them. People began to do a little bit more critical thinking and to become more curious about other ways of looking at the world. That was a very powerful shift. And as we saw in Portugal, part of it was that people who had believed um, mythologies, at least around religion, that everything that happens is a punishment from God, began to question it because they knew people who had died of the plague who didn't, had never done anything wrong, who were good people, wonderful people who didn't deserve to die. And so this idea of cause and effect and punishment and reward began to be questioned and it allowed people to expand their thinking a little bit and how they saw the world and that was essential for this movement into new consciousness that took place during during the renaissance and also because of this experience, this incredible experience of so much death taking place in a short time, uh, the arts were influenced because a big, themes of death and human fragility began to show up in works of art everywhere. Uh, also, there was an increased mobility. People moved much more readily than they might have in the past. They had to move um, into different areas in order to find work, maybe also to escape the plague. Um, and so there was more mobility in the society, which also helped cross pollinate ideas and helped people get exposed once again to new experiences and new ways of thinking as they moved into different areas. And then uh, scientific inquiry was hastened by the Black Death because people began to realize that however they were looking at illness and death wasn't sufficient. It wasn't helpful to them at all as they faced this horrific plague. And so it led to a desire for more knowledge and more information about what happens to the human body in times of sickness. And so scientific inquiry was really served by this horrible tragedy and catastrophe that had taken place. So Florence itself is the birthplace of the Renaissance. And it's interesting when you look at how many contributors to the Renaissance lived in Florence. But once again, I mentioned the idea of patronage and the Medici family is famous for their support of artists and the arts. So sometimes these modern creative thinkers were attracted to Florence to come and live there because there was support for people with new ideas and new creativity. But it's, it is interesting to think of how Florence became the, the very center, the hub of the Renaissance, which then spread all around Europe and, and eventually the rest of the world. So some of the changes that the Renaissance brought, which I found really interesting, were changes in art techniques. And I already mentioned chiaroscuro, the technique of using darkness and light to highlight certain things. And that was a new technique that came about during the Renaissance but also the use of perspective. Prior to the Renaissance, paintings were always two-dimensional, and you would look at a, a two-dimensional picture of people perhaps standing by a tree or in front of a mountain, but everything was flat. It was, it was only two-dimensional. And Brunelleschi, who is uh, an architect and artist, was credited with doing the first drawing with perspective. And then it quickly spread. And many of the other famous artists of the Renaissance, um, uh, Masaccio, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, began to utilize perspective. And now we, we probably can't even imagine a painting that doesn't in some way utilize the technique of perspective to show three dimensions, to show depth. And um, it's, uh, it's fascinating that humankind had not been able 
to paint in anything but two dimensions until the Renaissance and this awakening. It's like this new view of things was literally happening on the canvas and on paper as artists began to see how you could use linear perspective and create a vanishing point on the page, which allowed you to show that some objects were further away and some closer. And it was a phenomenal revolution in art to be able to draw and paint with perspective. So, uh, I mean, just think of, of how that dramatically changed art from that point on. Also, um, painters and sculptors began to paint with greater anatomical accuracy. And we see this in all the statues of Michelangelo, but other artists as well, who the bodies of, of the beings that they're representing in the statues actually have accurate muscles that, that you can see through this the skin. You can see the placement of ribs and muscles and the symmetry in the body and the proportions of parts of the body. This anatomical accuracy was also a new feature, but partly made possible because of of the revolution in science and the curiosity about the human body and the desire to study anatomy and understand how the body is put together, how the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments hold the body together. And so artists benefited from this expansion in anatomical knowledge about the body and being able to apply it in their own work, which led them to create much more realistic pieces. And again, uh, in terms of scientific developments, there was the the development of the theory that the earth revolves around the sun. And um, Galileo, who was alive during the Renaissance, was actually tried during the Inquisition by the church and forced to recant his belief that that the sun was the center of our of our solar system instead of the earth at the center, which is so uh, shocking in some ways now to think of that. Uh, he had to recant his beliefs and he was basically lived under house arrest for the rest of his life. Uh, for um, for being a proponent of this this crazy idea that the earth revolved around the sun. But during the Renaissance, astronomy and physics were also studied, and um, that's how Galileo and Copernicus held these ideas about about our own solar system. There were advances in literature. The printing press was developed during this time. Uh, Florence itself became a hub of ideas and because there were so many artists, thinkers, scientists, writers living in Florence, there was this incredible cross exchange of ideas and inspiration between all of them. The Renaissance was also the age of exploration and expansion, the age of discovery, a lot of which took place in Portugal and was inspired by Portugal and the royalty there to to send out explorers to explore other countries and uh, on the planet. And so that took place during this time of the Renaissance as well. And then there were great developments in architecture and Brunelleschi, whom I mentioned, who is the very first person we think to draw a picture using linear perspective, um, as an architect, created this marvelous dome in the Cathedral of Florence, Il Duomo, but it's also called Santa Maria del Fiore. The dome is the most remarkable aspect of that cathedral. Uh, when it was built in 1436, it was the largest dome in the world um, at that time and it held that title for centuries. It was built without the use of traditional wooden scaffolding, which was groundbreaking in terms of engineering. 
because uh, Brunelleschi used this unique herringbone pattern of laying bricks and also using horizontal stone chains, the dome was self-supporting during construction, which is why there was not a need for extensive sta scaffolding to hold the dome up. And so this was totally novel and a complete marvel and influenced the construction of domes for centuries afterwards. And if you visit Florence, you will undoubtedly uh, visit Il Duomo and it, it's visible from multiple points in the city. It really dominates the skyline of the city. It's absolutely beautiful and marvelous along with the tower that sits next to it and the baptistry in the in the plaza of Il Duomo. So the Duomo and the Dome is one of the most famous landmarks in Florence, but also, of course, is Michelangelo's statue of David. And we already talked about the Pietà, which is another one of Michelangelo's most famous sculptures. But the David is probably even better known, I don't know for sure, but it's housed in the Accademia dell'Arte Art, Art in Florence. And it's phenomenal also to see this massive sculpture and how beautifully, beautifully made it is and just Michelangelo's talent at sculpting in marble. This, uh, this image of David, the young boy David, as he's getting ready to, to use his slingshot to toss a stone at Goliath. And I'll never forget the look on David's face. That's what really made an impression on me, this look of determination and fearlessness in a way. And I mentioned when I saw the Pietà, it was the look on Mary's face as she held her son, her dead son in her arms. That was actually not extremely sorrowful. That was more um, placid and calm and compassionate in a way, but also strong. And Michelangelo was so good at portraying emotions through sculpture. It's really impressive to me. But as I learned more about Michelangelo and finding out about his life and the fact that his life was touched by grief numerous times. His mother died when he was just six years old. So he really, he lived his whole adult life grieving. And he also lost one of his very close patrons and numerous friends during his lifetime. And he was known somewhat for being a sad man, uh, melancholy. And there were are a lot of a lot of evidence of that sadness and his grief in the works that he has created. As an artist, Michelangelo also dealt with a lot of disappointment and failure and rejection um, during his lifetime. And some of the biographers have felt that he really suffered a lot of existential anguish, um, spiritual anguish as he went through life and that uh, in his later life, his works really reflected an introspective and somber tone. He was looking within and really grappling with the idea of mortality and the human condition. So as I traveled throughout Florence and viewed these artistic works by Michelangelo and Brunelleschi and all the remarkable creations that sprung from the Renaissance, it became so clear to me how sometimes devastation is the doorway to growth. And thinking back to the Black Death and then the Renaissance just springing up, like rising up from the ashes of the, of the Black Death, and um, how powerful that transformation was. It, uh, it influenced the entire world. It brought the entire world into a higher level of consciousness, basically, over time. At least it made that higher level of consciousness possible and accessible to so many more people. And so it was very inspiring to just be in that place, in the heart of the Renaissance, to see 
all just all of all of these amazing things that exist there and hearing these stories and feeling the energy of that and still acknowledging and recognizing the tragedy of the black death and how much destruction it caused it brought me to a new place in my own grief experience of a, a greater willingness to embrace being in the midst of the fire, being in the midst of the plague, in the midst of the destruction, with an eye to the fact that someday down the road, new things can be born of this destruction. Something new can come from this, something different, something expanded, something amazing can happen. And so, I think coming so close to this, the physical location, the geographical location where the Renaissance began and where the Black Death was so destructive, um, simply being in that area, it was the soul of place that I talked about before. The, it's built into and woven into the soul of this part of Italy that there's destruction, yes, on the one hand, and there's the possibility of transcendence and growth on the other hand, and that they come together. And that came through to me so powerfully as we were there. And so on that day, that first day um, for my novena, I was inside the um Santa Maria del Fiore Il Duomo in the center of Florence, but had already kind of been blown away by everything that I had seen and learned in that day. And I felt very humble about the fact that here I am, <laughs> here I am being overwhelmed by my suffering over long before the death of my father and then the death of a patient one patient in my office and um, and looking at the enormity of suffering and death that has happened in some of these geographical locations and how can I even wrap my mind around that and here I am carrying my share of the pain of being human I'm carrying that amount of pain and suffering with me and I'm acknowledging the vastness of all the suffering that has happened in the past as I'm in the midst of it. And somehow my own pain um, felt easier for me to bear in, that, in, in the midst of that place and the soul of that physical place. I could feel the connections through time and through history, all the suffering that has happened, but all of the creativity that has sprung from the suffering. And for the first time, it was just a, a very tangible opportunity to hold all of that all at once. And um, uh, for me, it, it was very profound. So I said my novena in that church, and we went on that day with the rest of our sightseeing. And I could talk for days about all of the things that we saw in Florence, but I wanted to mention here um, what, briefly one other experience that we had. We visited um, the church of the Basilica of Santa Maria Novella, which is a beautiful, beautiful old church um, built in the 13th century, but it contains or adjacent to it I guess is the oldest pharmacy in the world and apparently the Dominican monks who uh, founded the church grew medicinal herbs in a garden and created their own remedies for illnesses and again this was during the time of various plagues and apparently their remedies were renowned for curing and helping people of having remarkable healing qualities and so this pharmacy was developed and they created not not only herbal remedies but also perfumes and things to scent the air and various soaps and things and it still exists it's amazing it's been continuously open since 
for all of these years. And it's beautiful and amazing to go inside. And the scents inside are just lovely of the um, room sprays and perfumes and soaps, but also the herbal remedies that are that are still present there. On the uh, as we went there to visit, suddenly a downpour occurred. It was raining very, very hard. So we, we ran inside to visit in the pharmacy and we didn't want to leave until the rain quieted down. Um, So we decided to stay a little bit longer and we found that they had a tea room in the back. And so we decided to have tea and it was so lovely. And it was also, this was all around the time of my mother's birthday. And I had mentioned before in Rome doing a little ceremony, um, dropping flowers into the water on, on my mother's birthday. And we went back to the tea room and had lovely tea and little cookies in in this precious room, listening to the rain on the ceiling and on the windows as we sat in that room. And it was so beautiful and just such a wonderful place to stop for a moment and just take it all in and be fully present and just relax and be still and just absorbing the smells, the sights, the sounds, the flavors, and feeling steeped in all of this Renaissance history because that pharmacy is part of the Renaissance as well. Um, so it was it was an incredible day. We stayed there drinking our tea and eating our little cookies and biscuits until the rain died down a little bit and so we could go back outside um, without getting drenched in the rainstorm. But uh, that was all all connected on that day, uh, learning about the Renaissance and its its arrival after the devastation of the Black Death. And so for me, I was looking for and awaiting my own Renaissance to take place, which I could say eventually, it took a while later on down the road, I think that has happened. And I'll talk more about that at another time, but that was the third novena in Florence. And um, the next novena also took place in Florence in a in a different setting. So I'll come back next week and talk a little bit about that. And there are nine novenas total, as as you know, so we'll be covering all of those uh, over the next few weeks. So thanks for listening today and for staying with me here on this journey through Italy. And until I see you the next time, remember that we're here for love. So face your fear, be ready for whatever life brings you next, and love each and every moment of your very precious life. Bye-bye.